Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another one of our Pathway webinars. Great to have your company this afternoon. I hope you're having a good week after uh, what I hope was a restful weekend. Uh, I don't think the weather's particularly kind today, but I hope you managed to get outside at least at some stage during the weekend for some well-earned rest and some, some fresh air. Well, we're talking about a really important topic today, something really close to my heart after 20 years as a teacher and a leader, promoting positive behaviour for learning. Such an essential and integral part of the job, isn't it? It really is. And um, we can talk about attainment and progress scores and making rapid progress and all that and recovery catch up and all the important things that are on people's minds. But at the end of the day, it's about uh, hopefully creating that positive environment in the classroom, isn't it? Where children feel welcomed and valued and have self-worth and everything. I could go on, but uh, I know you understand it, which is why you're here. Promoting positive behaviour for learning. I can't think of a, of a better person to be, to be discussing this with than the special guest that we have today who has years of experience in the classroom. They're still very much in the classroom full time. She's just managed to uh, wave goodbye to her class and find somebody to cover her after school club so that she can join us now, which is terrific. During this conversation, you are very welcome to join in. You know the format now if you've joined us uh, several times before. Post your comments and questions. I will keep an eye on the chat stream. I will pose your questions to our guests whenever I can. And we'll also allow a bit of time at the end to do the same uh, if there's more questions coming. <clears throat> and I love receiving your comments as well. So please share those and I'll share them as much as possible. If you'd like to uh, post your comments, try and do so uh, for everyone so that we can all see them if that's okay. But if you need to post anything privately, then obviously send it just to me, of course. Um, you can also ask questions via the actual formal Q&A section as well as you know you can click on the uh, the question and I can uh, I can keep an eye on that as well if you'd like to join the discussion outside the webinar on social we tend to use hashtag the whole teacher because pathway as you'll know by now is very much aimed at supporting the whole teacher not just your professional skills but really your attitudes your ambitions your resilience, your motivation, and your all-important well-being. And I think there's nothing to affect our well-being more, perhaps, than behaviour in the classroom. It's a really important, really important area, isn't it? So let's uh, let's meet our special guest, Hayley McKetney, experienced senior teacher at Lee Chapel Primary School. We were so pleased to have Hayley authoring one of the actual courses for us within the Pathway Programme on positive behaviour management in the classroom. So it just remains for me to say welcome. And there, there you are, Hayley. The technology Hello. works. It's terrific. <laughs> just imagine one of these days we're going to do this actually face to face so that we can actually <laughs> run uh, run one of these courses with people there it'd be terrific wouldn't it but in the meantime the wonders of technology means that we can uh, we can join many many people on this discussion around positive behavior for learning well i'll stop sharing and we'll uh, we'll get into this before we start um for those on the call who aren't uh, familiar with you why don't perhaps you just tell us a little bit about your professional journey to date and some of your interests and, and areas of expertise. Is that okay? Yep, that's fine. Um, so, hello you. everybody, afternoon, even though I can't see you. Um, <laughs> so I came into teaching quite late. Um, I was in my 30s by the time I, I came into teaching. Um, and I started off in a school working as an LSA, but with a particular focus on behaviour, yep. because that was an area that interested me. Um, I'm now working in a four form um, primary school in Basildon, which is in Essex, and I've been here for 10 years. I've taught in years four, five and six. I'm, I'm most definitely a junior teacher, I have to say, um, with year six being my firm favourite. I came out of, school, out, of out of school, out of class a couple of years ago because I also lead computing across the school and support across our trust of six schools. Um, and I'm Key Stage 2 SEND lead. Um, I've done quite a lot of work. We are a teaching school, so I've done quite a lot of work mentoring um, training teachers and also NQTs. Yep. So at this moment in time, however, I'm not out of class. I am now quite firmly back in class. Back in class. Um, our, our COVID catch-up plan here, I don't know how other schools are doing it, but ours has been very much about streaming the children right. and making sure that we have created a bespoke curriculum that's going to um, address the gaps in their learning. So basically we've gone from four classes per year group to five or six, depending on the year. I've currently got, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the bottom class in year six. I've only got 14 children, right. all of whom are the lower ones or they've got EHCs. 
Um, and the idea is, is that we're going to be able to, well, we are, we've created and we're delivering a bespoke curriculum now that will allow all the children um, to make accelerated progress and to rapidly, hopefully, catch up as best we can prior to them leaving and obviously going on to secondary school. So year six for us is a real key place because they've missed a huge amount before they go on to secondary school. Um, so we've sort of personalised the curriculum really towards the children so that they are able to do that. Um, I was very fortunate last year, just over a year ago now, to, be, to have been approached by Andrew and Discovery to be an author on the Pathway programme, which was great. And my um, actual module, come whatever you want to call it, um, which I'll talk to you a bit about at the end, is impactful behaviour management. So it's just about little tips that might help you to make that difference. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. And um, it sounds it sounds a big job. I must admit, it sounds really interesting right now where you've had to uh, create those different groupings in order to um, ensure it's that awful phrase catch up, isn't it? But I, I, it is yeah. really important. Children have an entitlement, don't they, to be where they where they would have been otherwise. So, um, gosh, lots of operational demands and things at the moment. Lots of a logistical nightmare. And I know it's a big school anyway, isn't it? So um, my yeah, guess. Thousand, thousand pupils included in our nursery. But I mean, we're fortunate to have quite a lot of members of staff that are not class based. Or weren't. So, <laughs> like, weren't class based. So, no. like myself, literally all gone yeah. back into class to take yeah. a class, and we've, we're using every available space. So and how have you found, um, just, I mean, it's a sweeping statement really, but just generally over the last few weeks, how have you found? The health and well-being of the children i mean just very very mixed or just generally are they chipper are they pleased to be back oh they love being back um okay. yeah the, the, yeah they love being back it is very different it's a real mixed bag you can yeah. you can clearly see the children that have been affected the most yeah um but i mean we've had some lovely comments um when they found out we didn't tell them that we were that we were streaming the classes until they came back after easter right um and one of the children in my class um said i said oh you're going to be in my class now this is what we're doing and he said oh that's great i've had an upgrade on my teacher um so i didn't tell his previous teacher but never mind you just um, did <laughs> well yeah Whoa. um but, they've, they've but they took some, it well yeah i mean lots of them have said things like um i'm really glad to be back you don't moan as much as my mom um oh you look you look nicer in real life than you do on google classroom <laughs> <laughs> they knew I wish I was that um, around as well. Yeah, and then a couple of weeks ago, I had a child who bought me in a, a cake, a cupcake. Great. And she said, I've made you a cake because I thought you were looking a bit skinny. <laughs> <laughs> Again. I mean, I'll, never, I'll take that. I'll take that cake coming. all day long. Oh, that's terrific. That's terrific. Well, good on you. I mean, power to your elbow for pivoting and adapting and, and all those different things that you've had to do, as everybody on this call has had to do in the last few weeks. And and I just wanted to be, begin with that because it would be odd, wouldn't it, to have a discussion about behaviour in the classroom without at least referencing this current time that you're in. But hey, I mean, I suppose it makes it even more important, doesn't it, at the moment to be discussing this. And um, well, let's just let's just start. So when we've had conversations in the past, Haley, you've you've often and in the course within Pathway as well, you've often talked about um, positive rather than negative when it comes to addressing behaviour, accentuating the positive, isn't it? Eliminating the negative. Why is positive reinforcement such an important thing for you? You always talk about it. I do. I talk about it a lot, don't I? Yeah, you do. It's great. It's, it's optimistic. Just, um, I mean, I've noticed obviously having my own class as well i've been noticing yeah. this even more now but yeah. children need positivity yeah. um and if you if you are constantly telling them that they've done something naughty or that that, that mm. was naughty yeah. or that that was wrong obviously they need chastising but they mm. need that praise particularly at the moment yeah so their self-esteem for some of them is so low but also for their emotional and their cognitive development you need to keep you need to stay positive Mm -hmm. Yes, they're going to do things wrong. Yes, you're going to have to tell them off. Um, but if they are struggling to meet those expected levels of behaviour, just picking up on those teeny tiny positives, however small they might be, makes a massive difference. Um, and, it, and it's sort of, I mean, it's difficult. We're, we've all been there. You've all had that child that sort of tests your patience um, to the extreme. And you get to the point where you think, I really don't know what to do with this child. Yeah. However, 
on, on top of having to manage that, you've got to pick out those those little tiny, you know, those sparks, those moments of brilliance that make such a difference. Because your voice might be the only the only voice they hear that tells them they've done something good. Um, you know, and, and keep we we've got an insight into home life. Very small from my opinion. Um, but if they're if they're coming from a house of negativity, they need to hear something positive in their lives. And I think that that's just generally the way the way to go. Do, do you find that there are some children, because I always found this, do you find that there are some children who who really react uh, with suspicion sometimes and, uh, and almost flawed when you when you when you project that that sort of those positive micro affirmations you know occasionally you'll say oh wow, i would really really love that really like that the sort of it's almost maybe they're the ones that we need to reach the most did you find that yeah they, they, sometimes Some you can tell by their face they don't yeah. believe you because yeah, they've they maybe not you. heard it for a while or, yeah. or not heard it at all which is even which is even more sad um yeah. i mean yeah. certainly covid i mean that we can't we can't mistake the difference that, that that's made huge difference i've noticed it here we've we've all noticed it here but in, in, in terms in, well in terms of children's behavior on the playground we've noticed right. it and i've spoken right. to teachers at other schools who are having the same thing right so there's been a lot in the news about babies and not yeah. picking up language yeah. but you've got to think about how long have these children been without social interaction with other children yeah. of the same age and certainly from conversations I've had with teachers in other schools, it's almost like some of them forgotten how to play. And so they're playing inappropriately, if you like. Right. And then you feel like you're telling them off. So then you've got to have that positive. You've got to bring them back and say, you, you know, I, I didn't like the way you played today with whoever it was because it was a little bit rough. So why don't you, mm -hmm. you know, why don't tomorrow, why don't we think of a different game that you can play and sort of give mm -hmm. them the encouragement to do that. Because most definitely, they have lost those social skills, which mm. is really sad, because that's a a huge part of their development. Why do you think, um, if it if it has, well, we can address whether there's truth in what I'm about to say or not. But do you think it's true to say that managing behaviour has become increasingly, you know, more difficult in in recent years? And if so, why why is that? Or is it just more talked about? I don't know. I think it's more talked about. So I don't think right. it's, a, it's more difficult as such. It's just that there seems to be a, a, a bigger amount of children that are coming through with right. behaviour right. issues for whatever reason that might be. Okay. I don't think you can pinpoint it, but certain situations, like I've said, like COVID, yeah. have exasperated things. So having the lockdown has exasperated that because, yeah. because children have sort of forgotten how, how to behave appropriately, mm. etc. cetera. Um, the solution? I don't have a magic wand, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, you know, there, there are the temptations to turn into Miss Trunchbull at times, and there are the temptations to just um, just go in a room and scream. But you've got to remember that times have changed as well. So certainly when I was younger, and I'm sure I'm much older than most of the people on here, um, you know, if you misbehaved at school, then the onus was generally on you and you would be punished at home by your parents. Well, um, whereas now, your parents. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, exactly, you wouldn't want to tell them. Whereas now we've noticed, and I'm sure other people have noticed this, that as you go through, there seems to be this sort of trend for parents blaming the school. So it must be who you sat him next to, he wouldn't normally do that, you know, if you sat him next to this person, it must be how, how she doesn't behave like that at home. So you get a yes. lot of this. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, I've heard that many times. Yeah, and, and I know that you've probably seen this in, in your experience as a head teacher and, and as a teacher, but there seems to also be a, a what well, there certainly was almost a trend for children who were badly behaved and parents getting their child a label. So they're mm. saying they're, they're, they're mm. it's not, they, they must have ADHD. Mm. So, mm. you know, they, they must have ODD, they must have this, they must have that. And parents almost like, it's almost like sometimes nobody's stepping back and taking responsibility for it mm. and it's a combination it's of things and that is not to blame the parents if you know i get them i'll randomly get a Connors questionnaire out out of the blue from a pediatrician 
and say, and it will say, you know, I've been visited by this parent, please can you fill this in? And I'm filling in thinking, this child, no way, is ADHD. There are elements of their behaviour that are inappropriate, but they're not ADHD. I, and I, I just yeah. think that there's, there's so many, so many things that contribute to it. So as computing made in our school, anybody in this school will tell you I'm an absolute Rottweiler when it comes to computing. I am full on, <laughs> let's get it in the curriculum. However, if you think about, certainly Andrew, your children are, are, are younger than mine. So if you think about those, um, those games and things that they're playing at home, yeah, so they're, so they're playing games at home, sometimes inappropriate, sometimes not, sometimes they're just age-related games. But there's a tendency now, because of the way technology's gone, to use technology as a babysitter. So many parents are busy, 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 busy. They work full time, they've got children, they're trying to run a house, they're trying to do everything else. And whilst they're cooking the dinner or doing whatever else they need to be doing, the children may take themselves off to play on their games consoles or whatever it might be. Um, they imitate what they see on screen. And we did a little experiment, actually, my IT tech and, and myself. And my IT tech, we play, we play an online safety game here called Interland, which is absolutely brilliant. The children love it. And she took herself off and played Interland um, one evening. And she just wanted to get through every level. And she said there was a point where she was getting really angry because she mm. couldn't get through the level. Right. And so I think that some of that comes from the children. They, they get annoyed and frustrated mm. and and angry about things and don't know how to release that. Yeah, that's and certainly Sometimes true. it comes out. Yeah, and we've seen that in the wrong way. quite a bit, haven't um, we? Yeah, I mean, screen, screen time has removed family time, certainly to a degree. We have, um, we didn't do it this year because of lockdown, but normally for online safety day in February, we have something called a no tech day. And um, we turn all the computers, the whiteboards, the printers, everything off. No one's allowed to use tech in school. And the children are challenged to do the same thing at home. Um, and they end up playing games and things like that with their families. And it's surprising how many families come back and say, we'd forgotten how to do that with our children. Um, so I think a lot of it is to do with the social side, just as a general. It's, it's children not understanding how to play appropriately together. Yeah, I agree. And that's that's definitely been uh, exacerbated in the last 12 months, I think. Should yeah. we just, before we move on, just take a couple of comments in? Is that okay? I'm just going to share them with you because they're really interesting. Thank you, Nikki, for your comment. I remember in my teacher training, she says, being told to treat all pupils the same with behaviour management, but it would mean being constantly disciplining that one child. So, in other words, if you, if you, if you don't accept low-level disruption from anybody and somebody's constantly disrupting at a low level you are constantly uh, having to pick that child up so she says so i choose to ignore low level behavior from him he's had lots of high level behavior uh, and trying to balance it with the positives for him without neglecting positive and negative behavior of the rest of the class i can see exactly what she means here how would you deal with that when you've got somebody who is persistently disrupting and so you want to show fairness but on the other hand you don't necessarily want to be only constantly picking that one up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's, it's got to be individual, really, isn't it? Yeah, because you you don't want to keep picking up, like you say, the low level behaviour has to be ignored. Because if you picked up every bit of low level behaviour, you'd never get anything done. Because <laughs> you never would. You'd never um, but with with a child like that, you've got to pick up pick up the tiny positives, well, that's and they will I mean. be tiny quite often. You've, you've I agree. literally, you know, well done for sitting nicely on your chair. It's that old going back to um, the assumption that the child's already done it. So, you know, sit, sit nicely on your chair, thank you. If you put the thank you at the end, you're, you're not asking them to do it, you're assuming they've already done it. And that really does work. That was something I learned in my teacher training about making that assumption that a child has already completed that piece of behavior that you want them to do. Um, I used to do that a lot, actually. I used to say, yeah. thank you so much for, for, I don't know, for, for, for doing this, you know, for, for sitting quite, for sitting nicely, whatever, whatever, what does that really care how we sit, yeah. you know, thank you for doing that, almost as a preemptive strike, actually, and it worked wonders, but it never worked on my own kids. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing works on your own kids. <laughs> <laughs> actually, kind of thing, none of it ever worked on my own kids, that doesn't work at all, um, but I know yeah. what you mean, actually, and it's a more positive way of framing it, isn't it? 
then picking yeah. up on something. It's better to actually, with a maybe your force of your personality, to actually say thank you for it. For doing yeah. this. Before they've even done it, actually. But, um, yeah, so, yeah. It, it is. And, and also... And I get Nikki's point, that you don't want yeah. to be constantly picking on one. No. So from, from that point of view, you can also then include the rest of the class. It's always, you know, when yes, they're lining right, up for assembly, exactly. it's always, thank you for lining up nicely for assembly, you, Joe, yeah. or whatever. And then the rest of them, all of a sudden, yeah. all line up nicely yeah, for assembly. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, picking, we, picking out those positives. We've had one from Anna, actually. Um, uh, thank you, Anna. Anna says, I hope that the lockdown has given people a chance to step back and think about the why behind behaviour rather than just trying to fix it. All behaviour is communication and behaviour that challenges us may not challenge others as much. So our reactions need to be taken into account as well. That's really interesting, isn't it? Uh, That's so true. That's so true. We have to really pause, don't we, sometimes and think, well, actually, are we coming at this objectively or is it something that we're particularly sensitive about or <laughs> are we not having a good day? It's impossible, yeah. isn't it? Very yeah, good. I mean, we, we all get days like that. We all don't get we days just, where, where we just know. think, oh, I've really had enough by lunchtime. You know, yeah. it's, it, it happens, but it's really, and it's really hard to stay on top of that and not let it ruin your day or, or yeah. ruin the child's day. Yeah. But yeah, I, I do hope it's, it's helped people to talk, stay, take a step back and think, do you know what? This isn't this isn't just a, a one off. This is this is a something that we need to think more deeply about. It, it's that there is no quick fix for this. And I don't know about everybody else on uh, on here at the moment, whether you've seen the same issues in school with the, the change in behaviour since the children have come back. Um, those first three weeks before Easter, I would have said were more challenging than they are now. We seem to have settled now, whereas those yeah. first three weeks came back were real a real sort of struggle. Be interested to see what people say on that one, actually, while people are, are writing that, because I'd be very interested to share um, others' experience on the call, actually, over the last few weeks. We've had one from uh, uh, Patricia. Thank you, Patricia. How useful is involving parents in their children's behaviour management? How useful is it to involve parents? Oh, now there's a thing, because that's that's all in my pathway course. It is one of your chapters, I think, it's isn't three it? three Ps, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I mean, the relationship with parents is your first port of call, really. You have to get a good relationship with parents. Now, even if they don't believe you, their child's been naughty or they've done something, mm. to, to keep that line of communication open is absolutely key to getting on, yeah. top of, on top of behaviour. You'll never get on top of it if you don't have a clear line of communication with parents and if you um, don't relay the positives as well as the negatives. So most parents, when you phone them, if you ring a parent, they'll generally say, is everything OK? And I always say, hello, it's Mrs. McKechnie. No worries. Everything's fine. But yeah, um, because, say because then I, I always like to say, but, you know, it's it's taking time out to give them the positives as well as the negatives. So seek them out at the school gate or give them a call and say, did a really good piece of work in. Yeah, that's in, great. Right? Did. Don't yeah, always point. just look for the parents for the negatives, otherwise they won't want to talk to you. But I would, I, we involve parents right from from the start, well, really. I, yeah. I, rem I remember many a time feeling that there were certain parents that only ever got in touch when there was a problem, you know, when they were unhappy. They never got in touch to say it was going well. And yet someone said to me fairly recently, oh, have you ever flipped that and thought, is that because you only got in touch with them when there was something wrong with the child? And I thought, my God, they might be right. I think yeah. actually it may well be that some parents, I only contact them when 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 the, the, the little chap or the little girl has been kicking off. Do you know what I mean? So um, it works both ways, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, it does. And it is, yeah. it's nice to make that call and say, hi, I've just wanted to tell you, you know, yeah. that this happens yeah. and I'm really pleased with them. Or or more so sometimes um, at the gate when, when they come to pick them up, say it in front of the child. You know, they've, they've done, they did a brilliant piece of work in history. Put them up in celebration assembly, give them some house points, you know, whatever it takes to make that child feel that they're worth something. Yes, cool. Because if you continually are telling a child off, they will have no self-worth at all. And and then you're, you're, you're up against a wall. You've got no chance, really. So we've had a, a great question from, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I want to get it right. I think it's Farzana. Um, what would your approach be with a child with low concentration? Gosh, this would be this may well have been me actually, as my colleagues will tell you. How would you deal with a child with low concentration or me? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I've, I mean, I've got, I've got a couple of kids like this in my class yeah, at the moment. Me too. So, um, you know, it's, it's. Oh, sorry, our lights have gone off. Hang on, I have to stand up and move. I'm sorry. That looks, that looked quite, that looked quite cool actually. Like, like, like you're in a spaceship or something. Yeah, automatic lights. Star sorry. Wars Day. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's giving them small. So, in terms of low concentration, if you're talking about low concentration then evolves into bad behavior right small chunks it's breaking things down right. into small chunks and keep going back and checking on them have you written those two sentences have you right. done that now you know how are you getting on brilliant you've done you've done that fabulous yeah. right you can move on to the next bit now so it's it is keep going back back and forth to them um making sure that you're picking it up all the time yeah because otherwise you'll lose them they'll do one line and then they'll be like this looking out the window and and just and then that's when they start to misbehave because they'll start to annoy the person next to them or whatever it, it might be so we've had a few more comments and things but before we go on to those uh, and thank you for those shall we um i'm quite keen to to ask you the next question to allow you to actually share some of your strategies because if we're not careful we're gonna we're gonna preempt all of those so um because we're kind of getting onto it now which is terrific so um do you have any strategies that that seem to work consistently rather than just sort of little one-offs are there any that not universally because they never will but no, they there never that you would, no they never will but are there some that you'd recommend from a positive behavior management point of view um well obviously positivity that's got to work that works all the way that works all the mm. way through so even if you're having the worst day ever pick one mm. little positive and yeah. embrace them and that's i'm not just talking about from the children's point of view there i'm talking about mm. for your own mental health Oh, if right. you've had a really if you've had a really bad day wow. and really bad you know you you know we've all done that you drive home and you think i need to get home and have a glass of wine i've had enough but you've got to think, think yeah. what, what happened that was really good today yeah. so keep that um i mean teaching is a really rewarding job but at the same time it's incredibly hard mm -hmm. and it's incredibly stressful and if you don't focus on those good parts then you, you're going to struggle really mm. um remember each child's an individual mm. so there's never one size fits all never mm. and what works for one cohort might not work for the next so you have to change things around all the time um certainly what with the you, same children might not work the next day so what do you what do you do when a colleague says to you because they used to say it to me Oh, well, uh, this is a colleague who, you, I mean, I'm talking primary here. We mustn't only talk primary, actually, but I'm, I'm primarily the same as you. But what would you say when colleagues would, uh, if you're teaching year five and your year four colleague says, oh, well, they, they weren't like that for me last year. <laughs> I think it's a fib, actually. But anyway, well, how do you deal with that? Because it does happen. Colleagues will say that. Well, they didn't, they, they always behave for me. Yeah, and then that makes you feel bad and it makes you oh, feel God, like your, your, the strategies that you're using aren't working. Yeah. Um, but oh, hopefully that's not happened to me. But ho oh, hopefully, yeah. um, ho hopefully it doesn't happen. But I think that that's different. Children, right? Different personalities get on. So yes. the personality yeah. of that teacher might be very different. They might be much more lenient than you are. No, um, they won't. They might, <laughs> you just click. Some some children just click with the teacher. They yeah. just click, and then and that's where they know the boundaries. They know there's clear lines. Um, if the other teacher says they haven't uh, that, that it didn't happen for them then i'd ask them what strategies they used what yeah. did you do yeah. that was yeah. key don't take um, it personally I mean, yeah. yeah yeah i mean key for us here is consistency yeah. and i would imagine it's in, as in most schools so because we're such a huge school on a normal non-covid time um you've got all your uh class teachers then you've got teachers because we set you've got teachers that teach in sets you've got teachers that cover ppa we've got sports instructors we've got specialist music teacher we've got specialist art teacher um i teach computing with my it tech so those children see a lot of people in a day very much like a secondary school so it's really really important for us that there's consistency so if i'm going to to yeah. um in, instill a sanction on a child in one way yeah. i'd expect the instructor to do it in, yeah. in exactly the same way i don't expect to come back into the class and they say well so and so did this so he's losing his break tomorrow that well, no because that. that's that's not in line with what we do and that's not the strategy that we're using with this child um some where behaviors are particularly challenging you'll have a behavior management plan anyway which everybody should stick to 
but again they need they just need constantly updating because a strategy might work for i don't know some we've had children where it works for maybe a week two weeks and then it's and then it's gone again so but we've also had children here from from people referral units that have been put back into mainstream that we've seen all the way through to the end of the school and they've gone on to secondary and they've been fine and we put that down to the sort of the whole way that we do work together and about the positive um, environment that they're in there's there's always something good i mean where there are ongoing issues it's just imperative that staff are communicating with each other and that oh, everybody God, knows. i'm glad you said that so important yeah such an important yeah. part that is passing that or passing that on and and having a moment each week when you can discuss children of interest children of that you're concerned about and just learning from each other um uh, because you're not an island you know we tend to feel don't we that um we we, we are going to we we personally are going to turn this child around you know we're going to be the one that actually really really saves us and it's a lovely lovely ambition and aim but it's it's best if we learn from others isn't it i think and just and occasionally show our vulnerability and say, look, it's just not happening this week. Anybody got any ideas? Yeah. It's yeah. not working for me. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, with the children, it's more a case of, it, from my point of view, and it works for me, is mutual respect. So well, I'm, yeah. not gonna shout, I'm not going to shout at you, so I don't expect you to shout at me. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll treat you with respect and respect what you've got to say, the same as I expect you to listen to what I've got to say. And and there are particular children that that some of us will get through to and others won't and vice versa there's you know everybody must have children that respond to them but don't necessarily respond to another teacher and it might be sometimes it's a male female thing mm. sometimes it's just they click with that teacher um i mean i've tried all the different the, the different strategies if you like i've tried um so the rainbow charts where everyone starts on the green yeah I've tried that. The, you know down on the amber down on the red or, yeah. or, or up to the rainbow um, behaviour charts for home and school, they tend to work really well where there's a, um, an ongoing issue. So that really helps to support the parents. And I think that from the children's point of view, they need to know that parents and teachers are communicating, not necessarily talking every day. They do. They do. But need they need to know that we're both having the same conversation and we've, on we're both on the, same, on the same sheet. Yeah. Um, and start afresh every day. Oh. You never carry, don't carry anything over so important isn't it so yeah. important it's hard sometimes isn't it um if they were a little what's it the day before but of yeah. course you start again um yeah. i we've had just a few comments i'm sorry to keep interrupting you um right. should we just take a few comments as well because there's been some fabulous comments from people i really appreciate it peter um says there are two schools of thought in relation to SEND and looked after children etc some colleagues think that no matter what their need there has to be consequences for negative behaviours like other children for consistency's sake. Others may believe that we should treat each one uniquely. Uh, and it's a cause for conflict uh, of opinion sometimes, isn't it? Any thoughts on that? The conversation with the individual child, of course, will be different. So I, I'm, I'm sensing that you would say you have to treat it on a case by case basis, don't you? Rather than because there are some children for whom a, a very small act, a positive act, is a massive thing that needs celebrating and, and, and rewarding. But the same is true of, of others that are misbehaving. So how do you feel about that? What, do you have the same policy for all children? You don't amend it for those no, with SEND no. or those who've had a difficult background? No, but you, you sort of twist it to fit. And this is, this is have to. something that I talk about in the pathway. Yeah, you it's do, about yeah. knowing your children inside out. So yeah, you know where they've been, where they've come from, what they've been through, yeah. what their difficulties are. And there, there are, so from, from, the other children's point of view you can't make loads of allowances for these children because then the other children see it as unfair quite rightly however they they do need things tweaking to make it fit them but particularly looked after children i've said more so than send children if i'm honest because looked after children have normally been through a huge amount before they get, yeah, I've taught a lot, get yeah. to that point yeah mm -hmm. we've had quite a few come through yeah. here um, send children, it depends on their understanding. So obviously we're all inclusive schools. You've got children that understand um, the yeah. rules. You've got children, the autistic yeah. children don't understand the barriers quite so much. Yeah. So you have to, again, you have to adjust the policy to fit those children, but it doesn't mean you're going to get let them get away with anything. And I no, don't think they should be treated completely different at all. We don't. 
Well, I think um, Nancy um, would agree. Thank you, Nancy, for your comment as well, Nancy. Ben. Uh, consistency is key, says Nancy. All adults follow the same behaviour policy. The behaviour criteria is shared with children, so they know exactly what teachers are looking out for and what you know what what is good behaviour, what constitutes good behaviour. So uh -huh. that's a, that's a great comment. We've had another one from um, Helen Helen Cutterham. I used to work with Helen Cutterham. I hope this is. This is my former colleague. I wasn't expecting Helen to be here. If it is, <laughs> hello, hello, it's great to hear from you. So Helen says, oh yes, it is, there we are. So Helen, um, so Helen and I worked together actually some years ago at a wonderful primary school. Um, positivity is so important in relation to behavior, writes Helen. There is a wider picture of what is going on for that child. So a support structure is important with both school and home. I teach child development and really emphasize positivity and supporting mental health. Um, yes, you do actually, and I know you've got an extremely positive approach as well. There's a lot of agreement today with your positive approach, Hayley. Um, a lot of people have suggested that that really, really is an important cornerstone, isn't it, of how you do yeah. behaviour. Um, yeah. So, any any other advice for those who are really um, finding a particular child particularly challenging, or? That are just not feeling it that because i know this is something that can sometimes be all consuming and it can really turn you off the job let's be honest about it it can yeah yeah it can you can have i mean you can have a really difficult class i mean i had a baptism of fire in my nqt year i had Did you? Three, three children who, who were on the spectrum one who was a looked after child who hated me um and used right, to regularly right. throw things at me right, um right, right. but you know you, you you've just got to stay strong yeah i know it sounds really difficult and you've just got to go home and think it's not me because i think that that's part of the problem is sometimes as a teacher we take full responsibility for this and think it must be me it's something i'm doing or i'm not doing yeah i, I can't and i've seen teachers like that they say i can't cope with this child i don't know what to do it must be me no it's not you mm -hmm. it's just that you need to learn to manage it to fit you to, mm -hmm. to you know to to manage that child's behavior so that it doesn't affect you and and as as i know it, it's all about the children absolutely but we have to remember ourselves as well and you have to think about your own well-being your own mental health and you have to take a step back and go and say right i need some help i'm going to go to the center i'm going to go to the previous teacher i'm going to do myself a, a, a go on a course i'm going to um you know it, look at looking at a wider picture i mean certainly for us we did a we were all sent a, a link to a course it was a free course and you can google it and find it called adverse childhood experiences okay. we did that during the first lockdown second okay. lockdown absolutely brilliant was it absolutely brilliant i i found it really useful um talking about the where children have come from and how it affects them as mm. they grow mm. um absolutely brilliant so things like that don't always think it must be you it's not your fault, you can't manage it. Some children are difficult to manage, some aren't. And, and that's all there is to it. The same as we're all different. Some people you get on with, some people you don't. So that's that's life. I used to <laughs> struggle a little bit with, um, um, not struggle with it, but it was a challenge for me sometimes when there were some children, I mean, I remember in my most recent headship, there was one who used to, um, goad let's be brutally honest about it we used to love being chased and used to want the teacher to chase them i mean around the classroom down the corridors and, and would run into my office as a head and you know throw my spectacles around and whatever and just you know really want to try and get a reaction frankly I mean, th this was a little chap who was going through utter torment at home i have to say he, he really was he really was bless him but and i was encouraged to run after him and and there was one time when i followed him and he he went out into the playground I dutifully followed because I was desperately worried that he was going to run over the wall. Um, and he promptly ran around the playground, went back to the school door, ran in and locked it and shut me out, which was <laughs> terrific. What, what do you do in those situations where you're, you're in danger of falling into the trap of giving them what they want, which is a chase, but you have to make sure that they're safe? Yeah, Maybe that is me. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've had that as well. Well, it wasn't oh, me. Okay. Somebody, somebody else within the school I was working at. Right. Where we had, um, a, a, as we call, as we not rightly call them, a runner. Um, who right. would literally, and, and it started off that the LSA that was working with them used to run after them. Yeah. And then we said, no, don't. Don't run after them. That's what they want. They're That's waiting they for want. that. So you follow them at a safe distance to ensure they are safe. Yeah. 
but don't run after them. It's as soon as you start running after them, then they've got you and they've, oh, they've, man. You know, they've got your attention. It's a good game. <laughs> Let me just do a runner and say, don't run after me. Um, uh, when I was locked out, it provided tremendous excitement for most of the children who were all at the windows by then. <laughs> but, um, you know, that kind of stuff upset me. You know, I found, I found that kind of stuff really upsetting because I could see he was really struggling and I just wasn't, I wanted to help. Do you know what I mean? We do as teachers, we just want to help. And when, it's, yeah. when our help is not having an impact, you beat yourself up a bit. I did. Yeah, I think, you, know I mean? I think you do because you, think, you do tend to go home and think it's my fault. Oh, it must be something oh, I've done. Every day. Um, yeah. But then normally when something something big happens, if you like, mm. when that child comes down, like sort right. of 45 minutes later when they've come down to right. the, to the a calmer level, that's normally where I start thinking, do you know what, I, I've managed this. I've, you know, I've managed to, to cope with this situation and I've managed to get this child in a better place. Yeah. Um, and so you've got to keep thinking about things like that. You've got to think about the things that you're doing really, really well. And, and again, I think it's a lot of it is we put so much pressure on ourselves that we have to, we're a teacher. We have to be able to do that. We can't, we can't not manage behavior because we're a teacher. Well, That's what we have to do. Sometimes it's difficult and you can't beat yourself up. Reach out. You can't and can't do it. Yeah, you've yeah. got to ask for help. Well, I'll share a few more comments then, if I may, because there's been okay. so many coming in. Um, it's been terrific. Um, another comment from Nancy, actually, having high expectations is important. And for all adults to model exactly what you accept, never embarrass the child in front of their peers or tower over them. Oh, I'd agree with that, would you? Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing worse absolutely, than that. That's just making them look silly, isn't it? It's just humiliating for them. And, yeah. and you humiliate a child. We've had a, an interesting comment from Ian. Thank you, Ian. It's up to us to demonstrate compassion and you can explain your choices to those who don't understand whilst acknowledging their own frustrations. One difficulty is when conditions such as autism, Tourette's or ADHD are combined with deliberate negative behaviours. And perhaps that's one reason that communication with colleagues is so important. There is a difference between plain naughtiness or you know, de being deliberately difficult and, and um, a behaviour that is a symptom of your condition. I used to try and differentiate between the two and there is a difference. What, what, there is um, a, a huge difference and you and you can even yeah. see children children who are ADHD, for example, yeah. you know when they know what they're doing, but yes. they know how to push buttons and, yes. and if you let them see where those buttons are, they will keep pushing them, you know. Right. <laughs> you see them do things and you think, you're just doing that to wind me up. You know, you're not doing that because you're ADHD or, you know, the, the, the child who says, Oh, I behave like this because I've got ADHD. No, that's not an excuse. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't don't behave like that because you've got ADHD. You're choosing to behave like that and then blame your condition. Yeah. Um, and that's another thing is, I think with in in terms of that, not so much for the autistic children because that's much more difficult to get them to understand their condition. But children have got ADHD or ODD. You can actually help them to understand why they behave like that because a lot of their behavior is frustration because they can't control it. That's so true. That's that so way. true. Yeah. Yeah. But they're so frustrated because they they feel these things, but they don't understand why they feel them. And I think the problem is they get a label with a child um, with ADHD instead of remembering some of these children are five, six, seven years old. That they you know they don't understand what's happening to them, no. so they can't control it. No, no, they can't. When it's involuntary like that, we had one little boy who um, used to. Um, um, you know, his, his temper would, I mean, he was a real little one. I mean, he was five or six, you know, but he had a, a, a terrible, terrible temper. He had a temper. He had a tantrum. Let's call it what it is. You know, he had a real proper tantrum and he used to just completely freeze. And as far as I'm concerned, that, that's when he'd reached a 10. He got himself into a corner, got himself into a right tantrum, bless him, and would just freeze. And I was always asked at that point as the head teacher to then come in and deal with it, which was incredibly difficult. But there was one little time when he, he, he was brought to my office actually, and obviously they, my colleagues expected me to deal with it. He was already at a 10, there's no question he was at a 10. He uh, couldn't communicate with him. So he came into my office and refused to sit on a chair, but instead he wanted to lie down on the carpet, face down, and refused to move. So I thought, well, the best situation here, I think the best thing I think, or at least the least worst thing to do is to just let him leave him, just let him do it, let him let him calm down. So I said, that's absolutely fine. Well, it's not absolutely fine, but listen, if you want to lie there and just catch your breath and just calm down, I'm not. I'm certainly not gonna try and pick you up. 
because I know that, you know. So I just left him lying down on the carpet, which is where he wanted to have his tantrum. And I left him and I got on with some work, with the door open, of course. Unfortunately, my next meeting was with some new prospective parents I was showing around. And they, <laughs> and I think they might have thought it was an instrument of punishment, but it wasn't, um, where this little boy was lying face on the carpet. What do you do when the little ones get themselves into a pickle where they don't know how to climb down? Leave them to it? Um... Leave no, them to I, safe. I think I think you have to leave them to calm down right. because there's a whole thing about how quickly a child yeah. um, reacts and, and right. has that reaction, and then obviously the 45 yeah. minutes it takes them to come down, it yeah. has to be on their terms. Yeah. If you try right. and bring them out of it, if you try and get them to do what you want them to do, you'll just make it worse. So you do have to just leave them, and yeah, it might mean they're laying on your floor when a prospective parent comes round, or or whatever it might be but they have to make that decision because again, you've got to give them the responsibility to be able to manage their own behavior. If you're always telling them how to manage it, they won't be able to do it for themselves and they've got to learn no, to do that. That's true, that's so true, Hayley. That's so true actually. And I made that mistake, I think several times actually. Um, there's a terrific comment from Anna. Um, thank you, Anna. I, Anna says, I think the important reflection is what caused the behavior and what they're seeking. If they're seeking attention, is there a more positive way to give it and model how to get it if they need that burst of energy? Is there a way of bringing exercise into their daily routine regularly? So there's other ways of giving them the attention they they crave, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. It's giving them, you, you, what you've got to do is give them more attention for the good things and right. less for the bad ones. And this so is you, back to like positive that, Yeah, low level behavior, you just ignore that and you give them loads of attention for the good things. And then that's the attention they'll crave they won't behave or hopefully won't behave in in a bad way yeah. in order to try and get that that good attention from you and it's it's we talked about uh, we talk about on the on the pathway about um intrinsic and extrinsic rewards yeah you do it doesn't yeah. always have to be house points or no. something called golden tickets here or got extra golden no. time or whatever it doesn't have to be like that for some children just that smile that well done whatever it might be that that stamp in their book that says you know mrs mckechnie says this is brilliant work that's enough for them yeah and for some children that's that's what we've got to do we've got to keep giving them that with it it's got to be within them they've got to want to do it and we've got to be giving those non-physical rewards in order for them to to want to change their behavior absolutely right absolutely right well in the pathway course that we we uh, that we did with you which was a really enjoyable course and everybody on the team who was filming it said uh, they felt it was a really honest and authentic you were very honest all the way through it you know and it's not a master class isn't it you were sharing your stories just give us a quick i mean we've run over a little bit but maybe could you just give us a couple of minutes on the headlines of what each chapter is broadly about and maybe just finish on the three p's that you talk a lot about you happy to yeah, do that? So so um, we've got, oh my goodness, I've got to remember all the chapters now and I looked at them. <laughs> <with> them <but laughs> oh, don't worry, don't worry if not, don't worry. We, we talked about um, like ways, it, ways in which you can, uh, ways in which behaviours come out. So we've got to talk a bit about that, about how, what sort of behaviours you might see yeah. um, and ways, strategies that work. So yeah. strategies that work, we've, we have, um, we've got a round table where we sit and we just chat about strategies that work for for us yeah we did um, yeah. and how they can be incorporated into your classroom yeah so we talk about that we talk about um engagement with parents so this is part of the three p's so um policy parents and positivity that's are, right are the key elements in terms yeah. of making sure that your that it works uh, and there is no miracle cure that doesn't mean it's definitely going to work but they're the three things so the policy the schools have got need to have a robust policy and within that policy you need to be able to tweak things around and your yeah. your head and your SLT need to be confident enough in you to be able to allow you to do that to yeah. make it fit and um, parents obviously we've talked about the first first port of communication for parents and we've talked about positivity there's also within there we talk about um, how children develop and how they learn to um, understand the, the norms of behaviour, so how they should behave, um, how we as their adults are their role models. Yeah, and how we, we did talk about we, 
Mm. Yeah, or about modelling um, the, the correct behaviour. Mm. Um, I think we talked I, about positive, in, you talk a lot about positive environment as well, just generally yeah. creating that positive environment. Yeah, so really within nice. the classroom and within the school. So it has yeah, to be a whole really school nice. thing. Yeah. Um, and the whole, yeah. you, sometimes I think people take it as a, a positive environment it has to be quite a sort of strict and straightforward um, school where we are, we're very much for fun here. We have a lot of fun here. The kids love it. Um, but but it creates a very positive environment and they feel comfortable enough to be able to talk to you and, and they know where the boundaries are still. Um, although we have a lot of fun, it's, it's, there are boundaries. Um, and they know where that they come, so. As, as they should be, yeah. Well, terrific, we could, we, could, we could talk all day. And in your course, we, we have a round table with other teachers. We have lots of little interviews, just you and I chatting, listening to your um, insightful experiences. And then there's some cracking reading materials that you did. You did a really, really nice set of thought leadership reading materials. And then of course, there's those coaching questions that throughout, aren't there, where you're asking yeah. the person on the course questions that they need to answer. And you can't get them wrong. It's just your own experiences, isn't it really? Um, it, was, uh, it was one of my absolute favorite courses that we did, it really was. Thank you. Because um, it was very authentic. You know, it was no nonsense. It was authentic. Um, and it wasn't saying this is what this is how you do it on no. the assumption that what you're doing is wrong at the moment. You know, you no, know I think right? that's where the pathway is good as well, because you can you're doing you're, you're basing it on your own experiences. It's not yeah. it's not telling you you must do this. You must do that. No, no, it's not. It's more yeah, about it's reflecting perfecting. and thinking, yeah. what am I doing at the moment? And, what That's might I be able to do to change it? What might they yeah. be able to do to make it better? Just a little, a little, a little change, just a little improvement each, each time sort of thing. But um, well, that was amazing. That was brilliant. Um, and we've already run over. So, um, but thank you ever so much. And I know you had to find somebody to cover your uh, after school club today. And I know that you'll be faced with umpteen amounts of, of work as soon as this finishes. So yeah. I'm going to let you go. But um, Hayley, thank you so much um, in the middle of a really you. busy week as well. And it's great to see you. And I really hope next year we're able to make um, uh, a second, a sequel to your course. I think we should. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, we must do. Yeah. Take care. Okay, thank you. Thank you ever so Thanks. much. Bye -bye. Brilliant. So everybody, if, uh, if anybody would like to, to stay on the call, please do. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now and I'm just going to have a quick run through the, the Pathway programme for anybody who hasn't yet seen it. I suspect most people have now, but if you haven't yet seen it, I'd be delighted to give you a very quick walk through the programme and also mention a few more events that are coming up as well, actually, that we're going to be running in these next few weeks of the summer term. So what is Pathway? Well, it's an online CPD programme. It's all online. And we're very pleased about that because it means that you can access any of the courses and there's many, many, many courses. It's not one course, multiple courses. And you can access these in your own time at your own pace. You can save them, bookmark them and keep coming back to them. And unlike a lot of online courses, once you've completed each course, it doesn't disappear. It's still bookmarked and you can come back and, and change your answers, change your reflections as you as you progress. It is your online learning portfolio, really, your professional learning portfolio. And it's designed very much around the idea of developing your professional development at the same time as developing your personal development. And we'll get into what that means. And I genuinely think if you combine the two, then I think that's how you're able to feel a little bit more empowered because it isn't just what you know in teaching, is it? It's what you can do with what you know. And I think that's inextricably linked to how you feel. Let's be honest about it. So we try and get into that a little bit on the pathway course in terms of well-being, critical reflection, lots of courses on resilience, motivation, and what to do when you're demotivated and so forth. So it's a very human holistic approach to help you to become a reflective practitioner. That's its purpose really, is to help you to remain a reflective practitioner as the job grows uh, and becomes more challenging sometimes. We help you to orientate your career by helping you with your motivation, a guide to motivation, uh, some career mapping tools and some uh, skills, auditing school, uh, skills auditing tools as well. So it's really getting a sense of who you are as a teacher and where you wanna go. And then we help you to get there through uh, a huge suite of different online professional development courses with more being added each year. Many, many different courses. I'll show you those in a moment. And then the reflection piece, which is where we have a well-being and critical reflection course um, and an advice hub uh, authored by the uh, head of advice at the NHT. Uh, the whole of this pathway program is in partnership with the NHT. I should have said that at the top. We've been working with our friends and partners at the NHT on the whole of this course. Uh, the pathway program and we're delighted that they're supporting it so well uh, and supplying the most amazing uh, advice 
pieces, which we're uploading every week. I've just uploaded many more advice PDFs on the very latest different uh, advice you need for all the statutory changes that always seem to happen in uh, in this country, don't they, in education. So keeping up to up to speed with the latest policy and practice. Uh, and when you combine those three elements together, I think it's a, it's a constant empowerment. That's what it's uh, that's what it's about. Continuous professional empowerment, CPE. This is just a few slides from the orientation section, the guide to motivation, skills audits, two different skills audits, a teacher's skills audit based on the teacher standards from the DfE, and a leadership skills and competencies audit where we've identified 14 different competencies and leadership skills that we feel that you need um, are worth developing. And we then, like with the skills audit for teachers, we then drill down into those almost like I can statements that you then rate yourself against uh, honestly. And then you can keep coming back to those and use it as a nice discussion for your professional management reviews, for your appraisals and for your own CPD decisions that you make as to which courses you need to take. And then you can keep coming back. It's part of that ongoing professional journal. Um, so that you flourish in this career and hopefully stay in this career uh, uh, for a, a good time and, and enjoy it. Um, becoming a reflective practitioner is key, I think. Um, pausing to admire the view, let me say, I think. The career map is important where we encourage you to map out the professional roles that you'd like to secure in the years ahead, all those extracurricular activities that you'd like to develop and grow, because that's that often motivates us as much as uh, the role that we're in. It's all those extra ways in which we bring value to our schools. How are you going to develop those in the years ahead? And then thirdly, but most importantly, perhaps your health and well-being goals. They also go into the career map that you build for the years ahead. How are you going to really push your health and well-being and uh, stay on top of that and maintain it? These are just a few of the <coughs> online CPD courses that we offer uh, and each course is built up of a range of different films, thought leadership pieces and questions. These are some of the courses that we've already completed, made up of these exciting, very engaging films where we have round tables, one-to-one uh, -one interviews and so forth, filmed in and around um, various different studios in Manchester and around various parts of Manchester with uh, actual teachers that we're talking to, sitting down with and talking to them about some of these issues. So some terrific um, generic sort of courses there, which we hope will appeal. Uh, with more courses coming uh, hopefully uh, soon um, and then each course as i say is made up of uh, introduction a round table one-to-one -one discussions an interview and an outro and each of those is uh, are films at the top and every film is accompanied by an introduction a thought piece and then some questions for reflection coaching questions which you cannot get wrong they just draw out of you i hope encourage you to um, reflect on how things are going what you could do differently, how things might change if you do things differently, and what you've learned from the experience. It's about reflection at the end of the day. Um, and this is the final part where we have the wellbeing program by Professor Tim O'Brien and Dr. Dennis Guiney. It's a really empowering course, though. It's a terrific course, encouraging you to really learn about wellbeing. What is it? It's a phrase which is shared quite rightly so much these days, but what does it actually mean? And this is a course with, again, space for you to continue your own reflections and answers. And actually, you're encouraged to run your own school based little mini research project into monitoring your wellbeing and the wellbeing of others so that you can become a, a reflective practitioner. Uh, and then the Advice Hub, where we have 12 different categories, plus the newsletters and FAQs, and it's where we share all the latest PDFs that are coming direct from the NHT to share with you uh, the very latest advice that you would need. And we think taken in the round, I think that's a, that's a real partner for the teacher in your, in, your, in your career as you move along your professional pathway. I think it's everything that you could possibly need in order to stay um, positive and stay reflective. Authored by authentic leaders and teachers, you saw some of the uh, some of the uh, course leaders earlier on, um, with years, centuries, no less, of experience in the classroom between them and leadership too. Uh, delivered online with individual logins, so uh, all the information is uh, stored securely and safely, and you can keep coming back to it. So it's your own individual pathway, if you like. Um, and as I said, from the very beginning, we decided to focus on critical reflection and positive well-being because we think that's. Uh, a much neglected area of teaching. It's not just your professional skills, it's how you feel too. I hope that's been useful. Uh, look forward to seeing you at the Learning for Now Festival. We have three different dates. We're gonna be talking to uh, Dr. Deborah Kidd, very experienced teacher and author. We're also gonna have another one with uh, Hal Roberts, very experienced teacher himself as well and author. Two highly engaging speakers will be talking to us about uh, creative curriculum, teacher as storyteller, unlocking your creativity as a storyteller. And we're also gonna be looking at uh, health and relationships uh, the new PSHE, uh, RSE, RSHE curriculum. 
uh, with a very special guest uh, attending that one as well, actually, more details on that soon. So I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion about diversity and inclusion and equality in the classroom and how we address those important issues. So lots and lots more coming up in the next few weeks. And uh, I look forward to seeing you also at the next installment of the advice for the current times. We have these very regularly with Guy Dudley, head of advice at the NHT. And we're due one soon on the 26th of May. And uh, I hope you'll join me for that one. They're always brilliant webinars where he shares what's on his mind at the moment, being on the telephone as he is to teachers and leaders every day across the NEHT. And you'll be able to share your questions. And we always have many, many questions. And I bat them over the net and he always bats them back. So uh, please join us uh, on the 26th of May, four o'clock for advice for the current times. Right, that's it. Find out more about Pathway. Join the... Uh, please join the social uh, social media or visit our website, uh, which is just at the bottom there, forward slash pathway, to find out much more about it. And actually to book your own uh, no obligation free demonstration of Pathway, where we can uh, get in touch with you and give you a walk through the actual platform itself. Um, and we can give you a, a no obligation free quote as well. So you can get a sense of exactly how much this might cost for your, for your school teachers, for your colleagues. Right, thank you for staying with me all this time. It's five o'clock. Uh, I hope you have a lovely evening and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for joining us.